Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz, with me today, very special guest. You may know him as a former Omega heavyweight champion. He's been everywhere, the WWF, ECW. He's done it all. First name, Cham, last name, Payne. He's Mr. Marty Garner. Marty, welcome to two-man power trip. How you doing? What's going on, my brother? How you doing, man? Good. What's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Man, I... A little bit of everything, man. Um, well, I got a full time job, and uh, I'm uh, still working the wrestling scene, man. The indie scene. Um, I just did a little shoot uh, about two weeks ago for AEW for the uh, Matt Hardy uh, deletion match uh, over at his house, uh, over at the uh, Hardy compound. Yeah, uh, let me get this straightened out. But um, just uh, here and there, man. I did a little something for um. Uh, for GCW in January, that was January, I think, 22nd, I think it was, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, just been all over the place, man. Did a little something for AML a while back and uh, just having fun, man. Still out there and uh, trying to get my groove on a little bit, you know. You still keeping up with the business, I guess. I mean, you know all these promotions in these places. Are you keeping up with it? Yeah, man. Um, I'm keeping up with the business, man. Uh you know, I went to a show about, uh, let's see, about three years ago now, independent show, and I and I hadn't been in the game for about 10 or 12 years. I I uh, had, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little later, but I worked for uh, Dwayne Johnson for a while, and I came back, and uh, I kind of started drifting away from the business. And uh, so it was about, I guess it's been about 12 years, and I went to a show because I knew some guys on the show, took my little girl, I have a seven-year-old little girl and a almost a two-year-old little girl right now, and um, took her to the show, and she had a blast. And uh, she said, "Daddy, you used to do this," and I said, "Yeah, baby." And uh, I said, "You know what? I want to start doing it again." I mean, just when you when you're a wrestler, it never gets out of your blood. I don't care how old you are, you still want to do it. It's it's the disease, man. Once you have a taste of it, it's like crack. You can never get that taste away, hardly. You know what I mean? It's like you've got to have it. So uh, I got back in about three years ago, man, and uh, got in some of the best shape of my life, man. And uh, my cardio is really is, – it's great right now. I mean, I ain't bragging, but I've uh, got my cardio to a good point. Um, been in the ring a little bit. Uh, me and Jeff Hardy has been training a little bit together. Um, he's trying to get back in shape and I'm trying, you know, I was trying to get back in shape. So, uh, so anyway, man, yeah, I'm back and, um, just, just having a good time with it, man. And if somebody ever wanted to give me a contract, of course I would take it. Uh, you know, somebody said to me, you know, man, once you get our age, man, you know, we ain't trying to get into business anymore. And I looked at him, I said, who ain't? I said, bro, <laughs> It's a it's a win win, you know what I mean. I, I've got yeah. a good, I've got a good job here. I'm a land surveyor, so land surveying is never going to go out of business, you know. So if I get a contract and I get to work a year or two uh, at a promotion, man, so be it. I, it'd be great. When you look at that, right? I mean, you left the business for a while. You came back. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know what I mean? Because you, you step away and you come back, like you're saying, like you get almost like a drug kind of thing. So, is it good to get back into it, or do, or should you not get back into it? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, man. I mean, I, I could get hurt. You know, I understand that because I I'm still a fool. I still do crazy stuff, man. I still come off the top and do crazy stuff and go to the outside and all this mess off, you know, doing dives and stuff. But, uh, I don't know, man. It's, it's good for, for, for me, I guess my mentality. And, um, I guess, man, what I'm trying to say is that I've never been a quitter. I don't like to just quit something and say, I can't do that anymore. I don't want to ever do that again. I guess I'm trying to prove something to myself a little bit too, that I can still do it. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm still okay. And uh, I don't know. I guess it's for my ego. And plus, I wanted my little girls to see me do it live. You know what I mean? And my littlest yep. girl, she's only been to one match because she gets a little, you know, I didn't, we didn't want to scare her taking her to a match too soon. So she's been to one match and uh, she's standing up with her mommy over there. And I, I could see her pointing at me. She's going, Daddy. But she didn't, she wasn't scared. So, uh, 
I don't know, man. Uh, I guess we'll see if it's a good thing or not. You know, time will tell, I guess. How often do you wrestle like nowadays? How often are you are you doing it? Man, I'm only doing something like a couple times a month right now, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, and if, if some more work comes up, man, I'm in an area right now where uh, I'll have to go to Charlotte or Greensboro or Winston-Salem uh, to work, you know, that's Winston-Salem's a good good drive away, but uh, you know, but, you know, when I was on the Indies, I drive out, I drove one time for ECW match, I drove to uh, the Midwest for a show, and it took me 22 hours to get there, and all I did was a run-in for ECW, and uh, I got paid $75, and uh I drove 22 hours back home. Wow. Jeez. So, yeah. But, you know, back in those days, I would do that. Nowadays, you know, it's like, I'm not up for, for that right now. You know, that kind of, I feel like I've paid my dues enough where I'm not going to drive 20 hours somewhere. I'm not going to drive five hours somewhere. You know, somebody wants me to come, they can, you know, get me a ticket or something. But, right, uh, right. You know, you know, th- times have changed too. Things have changed and, the business has changed so much, man. Um, now, man, it's the psychology isn't like it used to be. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's run and gun now the whole time. And uh, you better have your butt in shape now with these young guns out there. Not not to say any a- AEW names, but um, you know Billy Gunn's boys, man. They they never worked the indies. I heard they never worked the indies, and they went straight to AEW. But uh, those cats. You know, they could work. You know, back in the day, you didn't hear tell of anybody not doing the indie circuit first, you know. But nowadays, man, it don't it don't matter, man. If you can work, you can work. And or somebody thinks you can work, you're going to get a position. So it, it's a whole different ball game, man. Everything's changed. But uh, I'm trying to change with it. You know, I'm trying to accept some of the new things that I don't really like too much. But uh, I'm trying to change with that, you know, the new attitude, the new era. To me, though, I know some of it's good, some of it's you know a little iffy. But the I don't know the lack of selling, you know what I mean? It's just it, and if they move too fast, I mean, am I crazy or is the psychology way off nowadays? Yeah, no, you're not crazy. The psychology is way off. Um, you know, Ric Flair could go in a match back in the day and work an arm bar and never get one boring. You know what I'm saying? He'd right. be in there for five minutes working an arm bar or something, a body part or whatever never hear one boring because he had the crowd so involved in that match. And I think the art of getting people to, uh, you know, get involved more in your match without having to do, without having to kill yourself. You know what I mean? These guys are out killing themselves now, man. I mean, they're doing some phenomenal stuff, man. Don't get me wrong, man, please. I'm not saying these guys aren't talented, but you know, I feel like that real talent was somebody like, Rick Flair, Dusty Rhodes, you know, Chief Wahoo McDaniel, some of those cats, man, from back in the day. Uh, Jimmy Valiant, you know, the Boogie Woogie Man. Those guys could sell anything, man. And it was so, it was so fun to watch. And if you look, compare one of their matches uh, back in the day to a match today, man, the moves aren't there. But I'm telling you, they had the crowd hotter than some of these guys will have the crowd doing spots the whole time you know what i mean you oh yeah I mean. you know what i mean oh yeah i always say that like some of the guys back then they'll do something very simplistic and the crowd go nuts to nowadays the guys will do something canadian destroy or something break the guy's neck get a clap get an ovation and then like their crowd is dead it's like wow like they did so little and got so much that this guy almost broke his neck and the crowd gave it one tiny pop and they kind of moved on it was i don't know very very weird the trick, here's the trick. Do as least amount as possible to get the biggest pop. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like a guy told me one time uh, when I was on the gas. He said, you want to do the least amount possible to get the most gain. He said, if you keep pumping that stuff in you, you're not going to get any more gain. He said, you're going to hurt yourself more. So you hurt yourself more, I think, with all these spots, man. You go a- After your match, you shouldn't feel like you've been in a car wreck. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, not not every match, you know. I mean, some of these matches don't have to have all these crazy moves in them and spot monkeys everywhere. I did, yeah. I'm like you. I don't like the not selling a move, man. If I hit you with a big move and you kick out immediately, that what have I done? 
You know what I'm saying? Um, back in the day, uh, I worked Jerry Lawler one time at, at WWE on a TV match, and they got mad at Jerry because he gave me too much. Jerry let me really do what I wanted to do, you know? And yep. um, he gave me so much, man. I was so grateful for Jerry for doing that. And when he came to the back, they said, Jerry, who works here, you or Marty? You know, um, but see, <laughs> Jerry was ahead of his time, too, because you don't want to take an uh, enhancement guy and squash him because who have you beaten then? Make him look like he's worthy of being in a wrestling ring, and then you beat him, and then it means more. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. I mean, Makes perfect sense. The problem with it, but, you know, a lot of guys will probably say they didn't argue me till I'm blue in the face, but. That's just my – that's my opinion, okay? It's like it's like a butt crack. Everybody's got one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yep, so. yep. When you look at, like, today's wrestling, like, okay, you know, it, it, in what we're saying, we don't think it's as good as it was. But, like you said, you're training with Jeff Hardy. He works for AEW. He's trying to make his comeback. What is that like? Are you guys trying to accommodate that style? Or are you trying to hopefully have those guys almost meet you in the middle or meet you halfway and, you know what I mean, work your style? Right. It's it's kind of a meet in the middle type of deal. You know what I'm saying? I keep I keep saying, you know what I'm saying? I gotta quit that. <laughs> it's kind of a meet in the middle type of thing because um I don't wanna go full spot monkey every match. I wanna do some high spots and I wanna make them mean something, but I don't wanna go high spot, high spot, high spot, kick out, kick out, kick out, all this. I don't wanna do that. Um, you know, my my thing um is I told a guy this one time. He came in the ring. He was going to work me one night. And the first thing he did before we started the match, he does a backflip off the top rope. And we had a nice match. And after the match was over, he was like, hey, man, how was the match? I said, first of all, man, don't ever ask anybody how the match was because they're going to lie to you. If the match was good, you don't have to say anything to anybody. They're going to come up and say, great match. Don't ever ask. I said, when you ask somebody to lie to you, they didn't even see your match, and they're going to lie to you. I said, but second of all, here's the deal. Uh, when you did that backflip into the ring, I said, man, you killed that backflip. I said, you did it later in the match. You did, you know, a moonsault later in the match, but nobody popped for it because they'd already seen you do a backflip. Yep. You, you, you ruined it. I said, man, lead up to that. Hit it at the end of the match, and nobody knows you can do it, and you do it, and then like, oh, man, that was great. And uh, I said, just make it make sense, dude. I said, and I was the worst when I first got started. My psychology was terrible. Okay, I went to ECW, and my psychology was horrible. Um, I'll never forget Raven taking me into the ring. He said, Marty, let me show you a couple things. I was so grateful to that dude, man. He said, look, just don't miss the clothesline. Miss it and look like he was trying to take his freaking head off. He said, don't just miss it and turn around and dance. He said, do not dance. And it made so much more sense to me then. I said, if I'm missing something, I got to look like I really tried to hit that. And I'm stumbling after I miss it, like, dang, I missed it. You know, that type of psychology, man, that type of uh, ring presence is what helped me so much, man. Um, and I wasn't ready when I went to ECW to be there. And I, and I hate that so bad because that was a big opportunity for me. And uh, I didn't perform like I should have, you know, and, and, and I hate that. But I can't take it back. And uh, so, you know, but, but now I'm, I'm having some great matches and I, I know psychology now and I don't get nerved up like I did when I was younger. And it's just so much more fun now to do than uh, back then, because back then all I wanted to do was make sure I got all my stuff in. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I had to get everything in. So. Get my shit in, yep. Yeah, yeah, let me yep. get it in. So. so how'd you get into ECW, though? Because I know you were like the Raging Cajun, but you were also one of the Dups, right? Well, that Raging Cajun thing uh, was by accident. I, I worked at WCW one night, and uh, they called me – that they mistook me for the raging Cajun for some reason. I don't know why, but I, I never worked that gimmick. Um, that was just uh, some kind of a fluke that happened there. Um, but uh, the way I got into ECW was, well, Matt and Jeff had taken off to WWE. Shannon Moore was at 
WCW. Shane Helms was at WCW. Uh, Joy Matthews, Christian York was at WWE. And I told Mike Maverick, uh, he used to work with Shane Helms. Uh, they were, uh, God, what was their name? The Serial Thriller. And it was Shane Helms and Mike Maverick. So I, I had Mike and I had Murray uh, Happer, who was uh, Otto Schwantz. And uh, Otto Schwantz uh, and Mike and myself, I said, look, we need to make a video. We need to send this video to ECW, man. I said, we're going to be the Duck family. Because Mike had said something one time about somebody coming in a locker room telling them, don't you come in here all jacked up. He said, I want to be jacked up sometime. I said, all right, we're going to be the Duck family. I'm going to be pucked up. That's my nickname is Puck. So I'll be pucked up. You're jacked up. Murray is bowed up. I said, and my girlfriend's name is going to be made up. And uh, we're going to do a video. And we did a video about how we're going to start training and getting into the wrestling business and all this jazz. And the video lasted about 10, 12 minutes. We didn't have one lick of wrestling on that day. We sent it to Tommy Dreamer. He called us up for a trial match. And um, Tommy said, I got to tell you guys something. He says, when we first got that tape, the first night in the locker room, we watched that thing like six or seven times, me and all the boys. He said, wow. we popped hard. He, he said, it popped us so much, man. We said, we got to get these guys here because it was funny. I, I wrote it where it was funny stuff, you know. And he said, we popped so hard on that, Marty. And uh, I said, well, that's good. That's what we wanted. He said, you didn't have any wrestling on there, but I want to see you guys wrestle. I want to see you guys work. And uh, that's how we got in up there. But, um, well, awesome. And and obviously the, the dup, I mean, it was copied by TNA too, but good gimmick, good uh, good creation there with the dups. Yeah, it was, it was funny one night. I was working Mike Awesome, and um, Mike picks me up, throws me over the top rope. You know, I, I do a singles match with Mike, and um, I forget who was commentating now, but they said, Oh my God, Puck's hurt. Call his, call his mother. Call his girlfriend. Call his wife. And and he goes, oh wait, they're all the same person. And uh, <laughs> man, everybody popped for that. But that was a great commentary line. But um, and the dubs didn't last too long at ECW because me, Mike, and Murray had a match one night. And uh, I'm sure put this out there. And uh, we were, and C.W. Anderson was riding with us. C.W.'s from down here where we live, too. And uh, so C.W. Anderson was riding with us. He's driving. I'm riding in the passenger seat. Mike is behind me. Murray's behind uh, C.W. who's driving. And Mike kept talking about something I didn't do in the match. And it's, I started to get ticked off, man. I'm like, Mike, I said, you need to shut your mouth, man. And Mike's about 275 at the time, he's, and he is jacked up. And uh, literally, so uh, I'm sitting in the front seat. He kept talking. I just turned around and I punched Mike right in his face. Bam, we're going down the highway. <laughs> I go over the seat. Murray's pushing me back over my front seat there. And anyway, we stopped and said, Mike, get out the car. Man, you're going to have to go right now. He didn't get out. He said, man, we got to get to the hotel. I said, okay. We got to the hotel and we had a guy following us. Uh, his name was Jimmy. He was a wrestling promoter. And I asked him if I could ride with him. So I rode with him to the hotel, and they got to the hotel. And the next day, they didn't want me to ride with them. So I didn't ride with them, and I got to the arena. And I walk up to Tommy Dreamer. I said, Tommy, I got to tell you something. He said, I already know, Marty. He said, you punched Mike Duff in the face. He said, now you're over with all the boys. He said, he's got a black eye. I said, he's got a black eye? He said, go look at it. He said, he did good work. And uh, – so that got me over a little bit with Tommy there and uh, and, and the boys. But uh, after that, about a weekend after that, they were supposed to be in Louisiana, and they didn't show up. I showed up, and uh, they – well, when they did show up, Tommy said, I want to see you guys for a minute. He said, uh, he said uh, Paul wants to talk to y'all. So we talked. Paul and he says, uh, I want to make you guys give you guys full time gigs after uh, Christmas. And this was around November, December. He said, After Christmas, we're going to bring you guys on full time. And I was like, All right. And uh, so we leave the meeting, and Mike and Murray didn't act too happy about that. And I said, What's the deal, man? We're not, we're not together anymore. And he goes, Nah, man. He said, uh, The reason we didn't show up yesterday was because we was in Stanford, Connecticut. I said, A WWE? 
He said, yeah, we've got the headquarters. They're going to give us jobs. I said, they're going to give us jobs? He goes, no, they're going to give me and him jobs. And I'm like, oh, so it's like that, huh? And uh, so that day was the day that I got the greatest news and I got the worst news. And then <laughs> you're going to love this. On top of all that, I called the girl I was engaged to. And I said, hey, I was going to tell you something. And she goes, I need to tell you something, too. So, okay, you go ahead. She goes, I don't want to be with you anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is oh, great. Damn. Dang, the same day was hitting. And I'm like, wow, wow. And, uh, but, you know, I was like, well, something else will open up sometime soon, I guess. I stayed at ECW a little while longer. And uh, I just couldn't afford to keep traveling like that without making bigger money. And uh, I had to lay it down at ECW. But uh, uh, then, then um, you know, other things started happening too. And you know, I, I recovered from that. But it was just a hard blow at the time, man. I really wanted to. And like I said, for a singles guy at the time, I wasn't ready for ECW. I, my psychology wasn't ready because we had to train ourselves, me and Matt and Jeff and Jason Arn, who later became Joey Abbott. We had to train ourselves, and uh, we we kind of I didn't I didn't want to learn psychology. I just wanted to do I wanted to be a spot monkey. You know, <laughs> it was kind of like back in the day. That's what I wanted to do when nobody was doing it, and now I don't want to do it, and everybody's doing it. You know what I'm saying? So yep. I've always been the odd man out on that, but and it's okay. But um, yeah, it was a wild ride up at ECW. Man, I had a blast, had a good time, made some crazy stuff. But, um, and I'll never forget that. I've got stories to tell my kids one day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With like that crew, just in general, of all the guys you were mentioning from like Omega, where does that all start? Like, how do you guys get together? How do you put together? And like, where does the, the, the champagne come from? <laughs> your, your awesome gimmick there. Like, where does that, how does that uh, Genesis all start with Omega? Because that's like uh, 10 guys, you know, that ended up on mainstream television, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, not to be bragging or anything, but I don't think that'll ever be done again in a, in a local federation that doesn't bring anybody in from out of town. I don't think that'll ever be done again, man. It was just that we caught lightning in the bottle. We didn't even know it. You know what I'm saying? We, we knew we had something special. We didn't know how special it was, but, uh, the way it started, um, I was, uh, working out down at Bass Fitness Center, uh, a little fitness center down here about four miles from my house in a little town called Bass, B-A-S-S. And uh, this kid was coming in the gym working out, and he's like five years younger than me, five or six years younger than me. And I'm like, this kid's pretty cool. I'm like 24 at the time. This kid's like 18. And a big jacked-up kid, man. I'm like, this dude's got some big shoulders, got a big back. This, this, what is this guy doing? We got to talk to him one day. He said, man, you should come to my house, man. He said, we got a wrestling ring out in the backyard. And I said, you got a real wrestling ring? He said, well, you'll see when you get there. And I'm like, okay. I said, man, I'm going to come over there Saturday. Of course, it was Matt Hardy's house I was going to. And I get there, and I look out through the woods there, and, you know, just a bunch of pine trees. But they had this black plastic that, you know, when you, and these, you can buy black plastic in these six-foot rolls. So it was six foot tall, and they had this black plastic up on its end, and they had it wrapped around all these trees, man. Had a great big area. So it looked like an actual arena out in the woods. And uh, you walk inside the black plastic, and Jeff had graffitied the walls with paint, and spray paint and everything. And they had a round trampoline with uh, garden hoses around it, wrapped around trees. And I'm like, holy cow. So I'm, I'm laughing. You know, I'm like, man, this is corny. This is crazy. And Matt comes out and wrestles Jeff. Now, Shannon Moore's around the ringside. He is actually a referee that's standing outside the ring, and he's about this tall. And I'm <laughs> like, how old is this little kid? He was like eight or nine years old probably out there doing this thing. He couldn't have been 10. There's no way. And uh, so anyway, he, he's out there, and I'm like, oh, my God. And later, Matt tells me. It was entertaining what they did. And he says, look, man, we, we make these videotapes. He said, if we put all these matches on videotapes, he said, then we sell them to the local video store in Bass, and they rent them out. They rent these tapes out. I said, man, come on, dude. 
And I went down there, and sure enough, they had three tapes in the video store that, that you could rent out called Trampoline Wrestling Federation. And just to, uh, to make it a little shorter, <laughs> we met met a guy uh, a few months later, man, maybe. Yeah, it was probably a few months later. And he had a wrestling ring, but it was a trampoline down the center of it. It was like three foot of trampoline in the center of it. The rest of it was plywood. So it was half wrestling ring, half trampoline. He wanted to start doing shows at the fair with us, the Moore County Fair, local fair. So we was like, yeah, man, let's do it. And, man, we went out there, and people come out to watch it. and was in, They were entertained. And they loved it. But after a little while, we were like, you know, man, we should really make this a regular ring. We should make the whole thing a hard ring because nobody else does this. We look like a bunch of circus guys out here. Circus delay or something, and uh, so anyway, we made it into a regular ring, and it looked like a soup bowl. It had a dip in the middle, and uh, man, that was a horrible ring. But man, we thought it was great, and uh, we went off from there, and uh, we were the New Frontier Wrestling Alliance, and then we became Omega. Matt had an epiphany one night. He said, "Look, man, I had a dream." He said, I think we should call our organization the Organization of Modern Extreme Grappling Art, Omega. And I said, yeah, we could use the Omega symbol, man. And at the time, they didn't know what that was. And I said, man, it's cool. Look at this. And I showed them. And uh, so we started going by Omega. And um, the way I came up with Champagne, we used to train every every Sunday. We'd train in Bass at a guy named Tracy Cadell's house. Tracy was one of the founders of, of this federation. Uh, of uh, Omega and everything, him and Matt. And Tracy's my age, and Tracy is the father of uh, of Tra uh, Trevor Cadell, who is uh, Cameron Grimes. So this is Cameron Grimes' father I'm talking about. And uh, we're all out in Tracy's yard. And we're training, and, and Matt and Jason Arndt was in the ring, you know, uh, Joey Ab. They were in the ring training. And I'm just standing out there looking at Shannon Moore and everybody, and I'm going, oh, Shannon, old Shanty Claus, old Sham Champagne. I said, wait a minute, what? Champagne. I said, oh, oh yeah, I like that. And so at the time, I was <laughs> now this this name I'm about to tell you did not come from Mortal Kombat. It came from a movie called The Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. Awesome uh, movie. Yeah, great movie, man. And uh, uh. The name was uh, Sub Zero that I came up. With. I want to be Sub Zero. He was the big ice skater guy, hockey guy, uh, on uh, that movie. And uh, so I was Sub Zero, and we did a show. The next couple of weeks, we had a show at Southern Pines Armory, just uh, 15, 20 minutes from our houses. And I told Matt, I said, "Look, man, I want to get amnesia. I want somebody to hit me so hard I, I fall out." And see, I, it was I was I think I was going to get going against Matt Matt Hardy for the uh, heavyweight championship or something. I said, look, when I come out to the ring, Matt, as, uh, you know, Sub-Zero, I'm going to have a champagne flask with me, you know, ice bucket and all that. I'm going to set it up by ringside. So when I win, I'm going to celebrate. So I get knocked out, and they bring me back, too, and they go, man, you know who you are? And they had a mic on me, you know, and they said, uh, you know who you are? And I said, yeah, man. Is he okay? And I said, yeah, I think I'm okay. And I look around, and they say, what? Who are you? And I look around, and I see that champagne bottle, and I go, I'm champagne. That's first <laughs> name, sham, last name, pain, former male exotic dancer from Las Vegas, Nevada, who's traded my G-string for the wrestling ring at pound for pound. I'm the baddest man in the square circle. Oh, man, everybody started booing, throwing cups. Oh, they hated it, man. And, uh, yeah, I got me a good gimmick now. I'm ready to roll. Because I turned heel and uh, right then, and everybody hated it. And uh, so that's how it became Champagne, uh, just from joking around with Shannon Moore. And, uh, you know, just, just by chance, it happened to slip out of my mouth. And I'm like, yep, I like it. And Matt hated it at first. Matt was like, first name Sham, last name Payne. He just laughed at it. <laughs> After a while, I said, man, that got over pretty good, huh? Yeah, I said, you know, it's a little thing called crap participation. They like to say it with you, you know. 
And, oh yeah, uh, they do, man. He, and he 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 kind of gave me confirmation then that you know he liked. It. He never said I really like it, but he smiled and said, "Yeah, they do." So that's the story behind Champagne. I love it. What's the relationship like throughout the years with with the Hardy Boys? Because obviously, I mean, you've known them forever. They're still in the you know in the business day. You're still training with them today. So, what's the relationship like then and now with them? Um, then you know everybody was single. Nobody had kids. Um, now Matt has four kids. I have two girls at the house, and I have one son who's grown and out of the house. Um, Jeff has two kids, so it's a little different. We go out to eat time to time you know every month or two we might go out and grab something to eat with the kids and the wives and everything and uh it's we've gotten a little bit closer here lately than we were for years we didn't talk forever man for you know 10 12 years there we'd just see each other periodically man every now and then and wouldn't talk or whatever and um you know a while back man said marty you want to get back in this game you got to become relevant again man he said uh he said people have forgotten champagne i said oh i know he said, so you got to get on Instagram and, you know, Twitter and all these social media sites and you got to start causing a stir again. And uh, I said, absolutely, dude. And uh, so I got on Instagram and Twitter and I got on Facebook for a while, but Facebook was just getting kind of old to me. I, there was too many people on there that knew me from the past and everybody wanted to chat every day. And I didn't have time to chat with 15, 20 people a day. You know, so I was like, as much as I hate to get off of here. I'm going to have to get off of Facebook. Had a bunch when, of crazy little cats still trying to get with you and stuff too. And I'm yeah. like, you know, I'm married now and I can't do that. So, Hey, when you look uh, at it though, uh, they're all remembering you though. They all want to, you know, reach out and touch you if you will. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and it's flattering. Don't get me wrong. It's flattering, but you know, my, I'm in a whole different place than I used to be, man. Uh, I, uh, I got in church, man. I got, you know, I got my, my heart right with the Lord too, man. And uh, I almost, I had a wreck one night. Got my fourth DUI that night. Went to the hospital and I said, you know what? I'm done. This is it. Something just came over me, man. And I was like, I'm done. I'll never drink again. So I don't drink anymore. I don't curse anymore. I used to curse like a freaking sailor. And uh, not that there's not times that I want to say something really bad, but, right. you know, it's, uh, my life's different, man. I, I live a great life, man. If I never make it to that big scene, man, I'm fine. You know, if I do, I do. If I don't, I don't. Um, but, man, I'm, I'm enjoying my life, man. I mean, you know, I enjoy doing stuff like this, man. It's just a treat for me just to just to uh, talk to new people and, and tell them my story, man. Because a lot of people, they don't know my story. And it would take me a eight-hour session to tell everything that, you know, has actually happened. But, uh, right. I'm enjoying it, man. You know. Now, obviously, I think a lot of people will remember you from the Triple H, from the pedigree, right? Is that do a lot of people bring that up in like that, that WWF match? Is that all, like a lot of people bring that up to you? Mention that to you? A lot of people remember that because that was uh, a you know obviously vicious uh, pedigree back then. Yeah, man. Uh, it, it was. Uh, Sean Ross Sapp told me he said, bro. He, he told somebody, he said, that was the, I know it was a flub, he said, but man, that was the best, you know, executed pedigree I'd ever seen. You know, as far as if he could have done that to everyone, you know, it would have been awesome. Right. Yeah. He can't do that to everyone. Yep. Uh, definitely. Pick a finisher you can give to everybody. And here's the thing about that, man. I, when I, whenever I took it, he was new there. I'm new up there, you know, doing some jobs and stuff. I think it was a 96 happened. And uh, he said, can you take the pedigree? I said, absolutely. I had no idea what the pedigree was. You know, I would just go kick. When he locked me in, I kicked, and it looked like a double on the hook pile driver, you know. Yeah. He said, GD. He said, you all right? And I said, bro, I'm good. He goes, oh, my God. And he pinned me. He goes to the back, and when I come through the curtain, he said, bro, you sure you okay? I said, bro, I'm fine. I am fine. And it was a rumor that I had sued WWE. Man, I never thought about suing WWE. I was just happy to be there and to do a TV match. You know, it, I, I never thought about suing WWE. Um, never. I mean, I took a bad spill one time with Jeff Jarrett to the outside of the ring. Um, if you get a chance to see that one, that was awesome. Pretty awesome, too. 
my right foot, I hit so hard. I did a scorpion when I hit the floor. Because I told Jeff Jarrett I was going to jump over the top rope and just to move out of the way. He says, you want me to move out of the way? I said, yeah. This was my very first match at WWE. So I, d- I dive over the top, man, and I see that cattle railing that I'm about to hit. I'm like, oh, my God. So I went straight down. I tried to go straight down and tried to put my hands down to catch myself from the fall. When I put my hands down, they just split apart like this. And I missed the padding by about that much. Uh, I missed that padding ahead out there. And my head hit the concrete floor. And then it hit the cattle railing. And then I was so balled up that my right uh, heel hit me in the back of my shoulder blade. Oh, geez. I- it is incredible. Um, I think they have that clip on mass uh, wrestlers.com. I think something like that. I, I think that's where I saw it last time I seen it. But bro, you need to see that, man. That was, that was incredible. That and, sounds uh, brutal. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Oh my God. It, it was brutal. And I said, you know, those first couple of times on the WWE, I'm sure I scared the crap out of this McMahon where he thought I was a danger. I was a risk. Because I was trying to do too much. You know, I, like I said, I was a spot monkey. I was trying to do too much. And I think that, that scared him away from me a little bit. And uh, because, I, you know, for years I used to dwell on it. I'd say, man, why didn't, why couldn't I get there? You know? And I think that was part of it. And I, I think that uh, he had heard in my personal life I was a loose cannon, which I was. Uh, but, Man, how many loose cannons did he hire up there? You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, what about Brian Pillman? He wasn't a loose cannon. Right. But, uh, you know, a lot of those guys were, were nuts, man. Vince hired them. And I always said to myself, it couldn't have been my wrestling because here's the thing. If he likes your gimmick, your wrestling doesn't matter. He'll teach you how to wrestle. I've seen him bring guys in that didn't know anything about wrestling, and he taught them how to wrestle because he liked the way they look or liked their gimmick. So I said, it was just something with my personality that just didn't, you know, mesh with his. I mean, Vince was cool with me. He, he come out there one time, uh, one night and I was, uh, I was in the ring working out before a show. And he said, it was, it was going to be a pay-per-view that night. He said, uh, Marty, would you like to be on the pay-per-view? And I said, you mean on the dark match? He goes, no, I mean on the pay-per-view. I said, absolutely. And we're in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is only an hour from my house. He said, uh, you're going to be working MVP. And he was supposed to work uh, Brian Pillman, but he's not ready for Brian Pillman. He said, I feel like he might be ready for you, though. And he started smiling. I said, yeah, okay. I said, absolutely. So I worked him on, uh, I think it was No Mercy uh, in 2006, No Mercy. I worked MVP. That was his one of his first matches. And uh, it went good. He just about slapped my he about slapped me silly in the beginning of the match because he was going to slap me. And I told him, I said, make it a good one, man. And he slapped me and he caught me right in the ear with that hand. And, you know, if somebody slaps you in the ear real hard, you, you kind of get you a little stupid there for a minute. And I hit my knee. I went down to one knee and I'm, sit, I'm sitting there looking at the crowd going, okay, what am I doing? Where am I at? And it took me about five seconds to get my senses. And I said, okay, I got it. I'm in a wrestling match. And it scared me for a minute, but uh, I was fine, and we had a great match. And, uh, you know, quick, but it, it, it was good. Uh, I enjoyed it. But another time, Vince came out there to me, and he wanted me to do a spot. Uh, was her name Kelly Kelly? She was a WWE, right? Yep. Yeah, it was Kelly Kelly. And uh, she was doing a spot. I think it was Mike Awesome was acting like he was her boyfriend at the time. And... Um, I was in the crowd. I was a plant in the crowd. Vince said, I want to plant Marty Garner in the crowd. He said, I want Kelly Kelly to come over there and start flirting with him and playing, you know, with her, with her chest, you know, on the camera or whatever. And he said, Marty, you've probably never seen a set of women's breasts, have you? And I said, nah, I haven't. I said, but it's going to be fun to see him tonight. And uh, he just laughed, you know. So we had a decent little relationship. You know, when he did see me, he'd joke around with me. But um, I just never got that. Never got that call. You know? so. Yeah, it's just with the Triple H thing, though, everyone assumed that you were injured. Were you injured at all when that happened with that pedigree? Not even. 
No. Wow, really? Wow, because he, he really spikes you. Well, my head hit a little bit, but, man, it it didn't even affect me, man. I, I walked out of there with my neck wasn't hurting. Nothing was wrong with me. Now, the Jeff Jarrett thing that I was telling you about, when I walked into the locker room on that one, I was talking like this because I was hurt so bad. I couldn't really speak. I was talking like Johnny Laurinaitis. But um, I, I just couldn't talk, man. And uh, that one hurt me. But never thought about suing. It was rumored that I sued about that thing, too, or whatever. And I'm like, dude, what is all these people saying I'm suing WWE for? I, I would never do that. Johnny Laurinaitis, not, you're not uh, his biggest fan, right? Is that, is that true? No, I, that's exactly right, man. Uh, I think you might have heard the story on the other podcast. You might Did you listen to that other podcast that I've done talking about? No, him? but I saw um, like a quote on, on Twitter, like, uh, you know, from one of the wrestling news sites that picked it up. It said something about um, you and, and not liking Johnny Ace, that he banned right. you from the back, backstage or something, something with him. Yeah, um, well, here's the deal. You know, I did a few years of, you know, enhancement work, you know, extra yep. work, uh, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I uh, I had a – do you remember uh, Vladimir Kozlov? Yes. Yep. At WWE? Okay. He and I worked about three different times. And every time I come up there, Vladimir, after the first time I worked with him, he goes, uh, Marty, maybe uh, me and you work. I said, I said, brother, it ain't up to me. It's up to them. You got to ask, you know. Somebody else, man. I said, no, I can't. Uh, yeah, I said, yeah, me? Yeah, I want to work you. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, so I told him, I said, go ask Arn Anderson, you know, somebody, one of the agents. So we got to work three times. And the last time I worked him, man, we had a great match. Um, <laughs> he comes up to me, just a quick little side note. He come up to me in the locker room and he goes, uh, Marty, uh, I want you to punch me. I said, okay. He said, no, I mean, now. I said, like a work punch? He says, no, like a real punch. I said, no, nah, man, I, I don't want to hit you like that. He goes, no, I want you to. <laughs> right now. He goes, yeah. So I hit him with about 75%, man, right in the jaw. And he goes, yes, like that. <laughs> he said, you do that in the ring. And I'm like, okay. So wow. anyway, we go out there. We had a nice little match. And, um, you know, of course, it wasn't very long. And at the end of the night, I said, Johnny, can I talk to you for a minute? He goes, yeah, man. And uh, he said, what is it, Marty? I said, look, what's it going to take for me to try to get a job here, man? And uh, he says, uh, well, he said, Marty, you want me to be honest with you? I said, absolutely. He said, we don't think we can make any money with you. I said, oh, really? And I kind of chuckled. And I said, man, have you never looked at any of my tapes I sent you, my clip tape, my my promos, none of that. He goes, nah. He said, I don't have time to look at tape. Man. I said, all that stuff I did, all those photos, all the videos, everything, you've never seen any of it. He goes, no. I said, well, there's the problem. And he said, I'll tell you what. You go make a name for yourself somewhere, somehow. Go to Puerto Rico. Go somewhere. He said, go overseas and do something. Fan somewhere. He said, and then come back and talk to him. He said, but I want you to make create a stir. So I started thinking about it, and I told Matt Hardy at the time, I said, Matt, I said, well, I got to think of something, man. And that's back when Facebook was going on. And uh, I had a little Facebook page. And, uh, oh, no, not Facebook, MySpace. You remember MySpace? Oh, yeah. Yep. So what I did is I, I wrote a blog on MySpace called The Forgotten Beatles. You know, when the Beatles came over here from England, they left the guy behind. His name was Pete Best. And uh, they yes. left him behind, so he was going to be the fifth Beatle. And he didn't come, so he never became the fifth Beatle. And I felt like the fifth Beatle with Matt and Jeff and Jason Arndt and Shannon gone, you know, I was the number five. You know, I was that was my, my click right there. So I, I said I was a forgotten Beatle, and I said, you know, and I talked about how people would come up to me asking for autographs from Matt and Jeff, wanting me to get them an autograph from Matt and Jeff. And I said, you know what a hard pill that is to swallow whenever you've got to get an autograph from somebody. And I never denied anybody. I'd always do it. But they didn't know how hard that was for me to do that. Right. And uh, so I asked Matt, I said, what should I do with this blog? He said, send it to every wrestling newsletter we can. And that thing in a couple of weeks got over 100,000 hits. And uh, we were just amazed. And uh, 
and about, I don't know, two and a half weeks, uh, Fighting Spirit magazine called me and wanted to do an article on me, like a, I think it was a four page spread with pictures and everything and me working for The Rock and, you know, me and the Hardy Boys together and all this stuff. And they called it The Forgotten Beetle. Great article, man. And um, so I was get, making some headway. People started a campaign online and they called it the Higher Champagne Campaign. And Matt Hardy said, Marty, there are people bringing signs to the shows that say Higher Champagne. He said, we'll be out back walking to our cars and we'll see a big sign that says Higher Champagne. He said, and uh, they're bringing it to the show. The one Monday Night Raw, Matt called me, said, Marty, you got to turn the TV on. There's two or three signs in the audience that say Higher Champagne. You got to check them out. I turned, you know, which I had a TV on anyway. And uh, I was trying to find the signs and I couldn't find them. And they had some of the signs blurred out. Those were my signs they had blurred out. I'm oh, like, wow. Dude, they got, they got my signs blurred out. And he said, right after that, they went to England and did a show. And he said, the Undertaker gets on the bus after the show. They was all riding the bus back to their hotels, and whatever. He said, Undertaker gets on the bus with all the boys. And he goes, did anybody see that six-foot higher champagne sign in the crowd tonight? And uh, he looked at Matt and said, Matt, isn't that your boy Marty, Marty Garner? He goes, yeah. He goes, what's going on with that? So Matt tells him. He said, well, tell him I hope it works, man. He said, I hope he gets in like that. And uh, a few days after that, Matt calls me. Well, first of all, let me back up. I went to a show in Greensboro, a WWE show. I'm walking through the parking lot. I see a, I see a car, higher champagne on every window, man. I had higher champagne all over that car. So naturally, I took pictures with it. And... Uh, so Matt calls me a few days after that. He said, Johnny Laurinaitis called me and wants your number. I said, here we go. This is it. And Matt said, man, hope hope this works, man. And uh, so Johnny called me. He said, Marty, did you start a higher champagne campaign? I said, well, I didn't start it, but it got started. He said, and did you, uh, did you give somebody my personal email? Did you give out my personal email? I said, no, I don't even know your personal email, Johnny, which it would probably be pretty easy to get if you just, you know, put jlarnitis at www.com. I'm sure that's what it was, but I didn't tell him that. He said, well, I'm getting three to 500 emails a day about you wanting to hire you. And I'm sure some of those were bought. Somebody had a bot doing it probably. But uh, he said, so he said, uh, I don't I don't want to see you anymore, Marty. I said, Johnny, you told me to cause a stir. You told me to, to make a stir. I said, I did. I said, Johnny, I'm just trying to get an effing job. He goes, oh, now you're cursing at a senior official of WWE. I said, Johnny, I'm not cursing at you. I'm cursing about the situation. I said, man, I've given all I had to get to this point, man. And all the stuff I've done, you haven't even checked any of it out. I said, give me an opportunity. Let me show you what I can. He goes, Marty, I don't want to ever see you again. If you come to the show, if I see you in your locker room, I'm going to have you arrested. Okay. Wow. So uh, I never went back, man. And uh, that's the last time I, I went to the WWE locker room. Damn. Uh, Any talks with him ever again after that, or that was it? That was it, man. Um, I didn't see any need. I mean, I guess I should have, but I didn't see any need to because he didn't. He wasn't digging it, you know. Um and here's another crazy story. I don't think I've ever told this on a podcast before, but I had heat with uh, with uh, Bruce Pritchard for some reason. Um, when Matt and Jeff was with the brood with Gangrel, I was up there and I was going to get to work Matt that night in, in a you know in, a, in an enhancement match. You know, he was up there full time, and I'm 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 coming up still doing enhancement work. And they said, all right, Marty, you and Matt tonight, blah, blah, blah. You've got five minutes, four or five minutes, and blah, blah, blah. We had a match planned out, man, because me and Matt worked each other all the time. So we, we, we were going to turn it out. And they're already out there, the Gangrel and Matt. Uh, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, no. I was getting ready to go out there before they went out. And Bruce Pritchard sees me. I'm in a gorilla position, ready to go out to the curtain. And Bruce Pritchard says, Marty, what are you doing up here? I'm getting ready to go work Matt. He said, no, you're not. Bruce Pritchard makes a call down to the locker room or wherever. He has somebody get up there within like a minute and a half, and they went out there and worked Matt. And I'm like, wow. What? 
what was that about? You know, um, you know, uh, and I'll say, I'll tell you this too. One time I was up there and, um, road dog looked at me and said, Marty Garner, you are here more than anybody I know. He said, why ain't you got a job yet? And, uh, actually let me back up and say this that same day i was in catering undertaker walked in and said marty garner you're here more than i am what's going on with that some man just trying to get a job big boy and he just started laughing and uh so uh road dog says that day he goes marty i just can't believe you ain't got a job yet he said i'm gonna find out why you ain't got a job up here he said i'm gonna go talk to vince and so i don't know Sometimes Road Dog ribbed people, so I don't know if he was ribbing me or what, but he come back in about an hour. He said, Marty, what did you do to piss Vince off? I said, nothing. He said that you come in the locker room like you own the place and you come in with your cowboy hats on and you, you crazy gear. I said, bro, I'm just trying to be a wrestler. I don't know what to do. I said, I talk to everybody. I'm nice to everybody. I said, are you serious, man? Did you really talk to him? He goes, yeah. He said he's got some kind of heat with you about that. And I said, wow. So I went and talked to Shane, his son. And uh, I was talking to Shane, man. I was tearing up. I said, Shane, I don't know what I've done, man. I said, man, I'm working my tail off trying to be here. I said, you know, and I started to tear up. I said, man, I'm sorry. He goes, no, nah, man, I know what it's like to chase a dream. And I'm thinking, no, you don't. <laughs> You were a rich boy. You've never yeah. chased him. But uh, anyway, but I like Shane. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like Shane a lot. He was a very cool dude. But uh, I finally just had to walk off because I was about just to lose it, man. And I was like, man. And, you know, just little stuff like that kept happening. Here's another crazy story I'll tell you real quick. If I'm talking too much, just cut me off, bro. But I'm just Oh, no, go. It. Go. Perfect. So, Jason... Joey Abs, he gets a job up there, you know. And uh, everybody's telling me after Matt and Jeff left Omega, they said, Marty, you're the next guy to go. Jason went next. Janet Moore went next. Joey Mercury, Christian York, they went next. Mike Maverick, Murray Haffer, they went next. And I'm like, man, I guess, you know, I'm never going. So Jason's up there. And I, like I told you, my psychology was a little bit off. Jason says, I'm standing outside uh, at WWE headquarters where they out. He was in the weight room or something. He goes, and Shane McMahon comes up to me and says, guess who we, we were just talking about? He goes, who? He said, Marty Garner. He said, let me ask you a question, Jason. Did he run over his girlfriend with a Corvette? And Jason knew the story. I was going on a wrestling trip, and she was about a nut job anyway. She hits me with her poor pet because she didn't want me to leave. She was mad at me. And I'm walking across the park a lot to meet Mike and Murray at the gym. And I have my bags in hand. And we've been arguing all night. And I hear the Corvette behind me. And she hit me. And of course, the Corvette's hood is scooped down. Thank God. So she didn't run over me with the tires. I just rolled off the hood and went over and made a, uh, a pay phone call because my cell phone was crushed from the night before. Uh, I'd gotten mad and, uh, anyway, had to get the police out there. And, uh, so she hit me with the car and Mike and Murray, when they got in the car, they were like, dude, you got to get rid of her, man. She's going to kill you. So they asked Jason about this thing that I run over my girlfriend with a car and Jason says, man, I don't know. I don't know the whole story, man. I don't know what happened. And I'm like, Jason, why did you say that? Because, bro, I thought they were testing me. I didn't know. I don't know the whole story. I said, yes, I told you the whole story, dude. What are you doing? Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. He, he, he buried me right there. And it, then he tells me this. He says, a week later, he says, Shane comes up to me. He says, man, we're talking about Marty again today in the business meeting. He says, uh, how's Marty in the ring? Jason said, well, he's a little crazy, but he said, he'll do whatever you want him to do. I said, dude. Now, Jason tells me, I'm not making this up. This is what Jason told me. He would tell you this right now if he was sitting here. I said, Jason, as many matches as me and you work, as hard as you know I want to get up there, and you're going to say something like that? He said, man, if I'd have told him something different and you went up there and did something crazy, he said, then I'd have been in trouble. I said, Jason, 
dude. So he buried me twice like that, and he told me he buried me. You know, he didn't say I buried you, but he told me what he said, and I pretty much buried me. Yeah, which is burying you. Yeah, yep. So, and another another quick story for you. This is a good one. Shannon, I'm gonna tell you this too. Shannon Moore. Shannon was like 19, 18 or 19. We're at Matt's house one day. Me, Matt, Jeff, Shannon, inside the house, and the phone rings. It's a call from WCW looking for Shannon. They called his house, and they, uh, it was Chris Candido. And uh, not Chris Candido, Chris Canyon uh, had called looking for Shannon and uh, because they wanted to bring in somebody young down there, uh, you know, good-looking kid, and wanted to do a tryout match with him. And uh, so Shan- Matt talked to him for a little while, and then he says, Shannon, this is for you. It's WCW. They want to give you a contract. Shannon gets on the phone, blah, blah, blah. A week later, they were going to be in Atlanta. And uh, so I tell Shannon, I said, look, man, if you want me to ride down there to Atlanta with you, I'll drop you off at the arena at 1 or 2 o'clock, whatever time you got to be there. I said, I'll go to the mall. I said, and if they want you to work somebody that you know, you call me. I'll come back to the arena, me and you will work, and I'll put you over big, man. I said, it might give me a look, too. He said, all right, man, I'll think about that. And a few days later, he called me. He said, man, I think I'm going to go by myself, man. I said, okay. Come to find out, he took Shane Helms with him. And him and Shane tried out, and they both got a job. I'm like, wow. So anyway, um, he said, well, I just, I, I, I didn't know what to do, man. He said, and I, the reason I took Shane was because, you know, he was a little bit younger than you and this and that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Okay, so that happened too, and it that broke my heart right there. I couldn't believe it, but uh, you know, but that's some of the some of the stories, and not not to say poor pitiful me, but I mean everything happened for a reason, and it wasn't meant for me to be there at that time. I might not be here right now if I'd have been there. I might have died, you know, horrified. Right. Anyway, right. Yeah, you never know. Think about what might have happened. You know, it's fun to think about that. What might have happened. Now, as we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish here. We mentioned it before. How the hell did you start working for Dwayne The Rock Johnson? How did, how did that all come about? You're basically his assistant, right? Right. Um, well, here's what happened. I'm going to try to condense this story down a little bit. Um, I was working I was working a show in Raleigh one night, me and my buddy uh, Scott Matthews, who, is, uh, who used to be a black skull. And uh, anyway, Scott – got approached by a guy. He said, man, I'm with Epic Games. He said, I'd like you to come do some stunts for me, man, because Scott did standing back flip and all this crazy stuff. And Scott told him once he started working for him a little bit, he said, man, did you know? Did you see Champagne the other night? He said, yeah, man. He said, would you want him to come work too? He said, yeah, absolutely. They so brought me up and I started working for him and um, man, he's paying me a hundred bucks an hour, man. I thought that was great. And uh, so then he sends me to California this guy wants me to go to California uh, to do uh, a game with his friend out there. And uh, I can't remember the name of that place, but uh, anyway, I'm doing stunts out there. Me and Murray Happer went out there, uh, bowed up. And uh, we go out there and doing stunts. And the guy says, Hey man, do you know Dwayne Johnson? I said, yeah. He said, he's out, he's out here doing a movie right now. He said, how good do you know him? I said, well, I used to know him at WWE and we hung out a little bit, man. I said, man, he's a cool dude, man. He said, well, I'm going to call him and tell him you're with me. I said, okay. Because he got it. He said, I got his number last week. He called and left a message, and Rock never called back the next day. I felt like an idiot. And uh, hmm. he said, well, he's, he's doing a movie down. You know, I know where the movie set's at. I said, man, I don't know about, you know, I might get heat if I get on there. He said, nah, you with me, man. He said, it's, it's my fault. If anything wrong happens. I said, okay. We get on there, we see a stunt double. And uh, tell him why I read. And Tony White said, yeah, Dwayne's already gone, man. He said, y'all come to the bar with him. We went to the bar with him. And he calls Rock on a cell phone, and I could hear Rock talking on the other end. You know, he had the phone to his ear, but you could still hear him. He said, he told him, he said, you know a guy named Champagne? He said, Marty Garner. He said, yeah, man. He said, he's here with me. No way. He said, put him on the phone. Put him on the phone. I got on the phone. He said, what are you doing in California, man? I said, I'm doing some stunts on a video game. He goes, dude, you got to come out tomorrow night to Hollywood and Vine. We're shooting a scene for the rundown on Hollywood and Vine from 12 midnight to 6 in the morning. 
I said, all right, I'll, I'll come out there. I don't know what time. He said, it don't matter what time. It doesn't matter. Anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we get out there and uh, they say cut. As soon as they say cut, he goes, first name Sham, last name Payne. He went through my whole spiel. I mean, and I'm like, I didn't know he knew my whole spiel, but I had given him a tape of me doing my mic work and stuff, and he had actually memorized it. And uh, after he, he's done, everybody's clapping. He goes, no, that ain't me. That's him. He said, that's champagne right there. And he come up and hugged me, man. He said, boy, you look good and this and that. And we went to the dinner table that night, man, and we, we ate dinner with, with Rock. And uh, he, he said something, man, I don't tell a lot of people because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, that's the end. He said, look, I'm not saying I stole Marty's lines, he said, but I love the way he did his promos. He said, so I stole a little bit of that on my promos. And I'm like, wow. And I about teared up right there. I was like, wow, that's big. He just said that. And uh, anyway, he tells me, man, you got to stay to the weekend. I said, man, I got to go back to work. He said, let me call you, boss. You got to stay to the weekend. He said, we're doing a wrap-up party on Saturday, man. I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll put you in a hotel and all that, man. So I stayed, and uh, Murray went back home and, you know, all that. And, man, had a blast. Uh, met Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake the first night. We was hanging out at some club in California, and I'm thinking, this ain't happening to me. This is crazy. Right. So that was in January 2003. And in March 2003, they had WrestleMania where Rock was wrestling uh, Stone Cold. And uh, I, I don't even know what number of WrestleMania that was. But uh, anyway. 19. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and anyway, it was Stone Cold's last match, of course. And Rock didn't know I was coming out there. And he found out I was out there at the hotel. And I've come out there with like 100 bucks in my pocket. And I was about broke by the time I got to the hotel. I didn't have a room, didn't have anything planned. I just come out there on a whim. I said, yeah, I'm just going to go out there. He said, man, where are you staying at, man? I said, I'm trying to stay at this hotel, man. He said, "He said, uh, Matt and Jeff got your room or Shannon or anybody? I said, or Shane? I said, nah. He said, you go stay with Tunawai, man. He said, Tunawai, you got an extra bed. He said, man, he don't mind. He said, do you, Tunawai? He said, no, man, come on. So he said, I want you to come out to eat with us tonight too, Marty. He said, me, Ray Mysterio, a bunch of the boys are going out. So we went out to eat. And I, I forget who all went out, but we had like 10 people. And uh, the bill comes, and the bill is like $1,600 for the meal. And I had a AT&T phone card in my pocket for like 30 minutes. On Back in the day, you had to use 30-minute phone cards to make long-distance calls on your cell phone. So I throw that. It looked like a credit card. So I throw it down on top of the bill. I said, take care of it with that. And Rock came unglued. He thought that was the funniest thing. He said, boy, you better put them 30 minutes back in your pocket. <laughs> and uh, I said, look here, man, go ahead and buy yourself something pretty with that, too, if you want to. And uh, on the way back to the hotel, he told me this later. He said, man, you broke my heart that night. You asked me this question. He said, you asked me if you should buy a ticket to WrestleMania or should you come in the back. He said, and that broke my heart. And that's when I told you, you come with me to WrestleMania tomorrow. And I went with Rock, me, him, and a stunt double went out that morning, ran out to the limo, man. There was a crowd of people out there, man, trying to get to the limo. Rock pulls his glasses down and looked at me when he got in the limo. He said, you ain't never seen nothing like that, have you? I said, not from where I'm from. <laughs> and uh, he thought right. that was – anyway, I stayed an extra couple of days after WrestleMania, man, and um, I get a call from Rock about two months, three months later, and uh, he says, look, man, you ain't never asked me for nothing, man. He said, now I'm going to ask you for something. He said, you've always wanted to be my friend, and I appreciate you for that. He said, so would you like to come work on a movie set with me? Uh, the movie's called Walking Tall. We're going to film it in Vancouver, Canada. He said, I'll pay you $2,500 a week, put you up in a five-diamond hotel, and all expenses are paid. I said, let me check on that. Yep. And uh, next thing I know, man, two weeks later, I was in Vancouver, Canada for 10 weeks filming Walking Tall. And, uh, had a blast. And uh, we went all over the – man, we, we went halfway around the world, man, on private jets and stuff, man. And I still can't believe I got to do all that, you know. I'm from a little bitty town of 785 people, and I got to fly with the rock all over the world. I, 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 I witnessed him become a high chief of Samoa. I've been with him in Australia, man, all over the place, man. And it's just it was just so unreal, man. I had 
the first night I'm in Vancouver, let me back up and just say this real quick. I know we're winding up, but the first night I'm in Vancouver with him, I'm standing in the VIP of a nightclub. He's behind me talking to a bunch of people. We're in the VIP section. The VIP section is like five feet above the dance floor. And I'm looking down on everybody, man. And I'm like, this ain't happening. I'm in another country. I'm working for a movie company, making $2,500 a week. And I'm working for The Rock. This is unreal, man. So he comes up to me, puts his arm around my shoulder. He goes, hey, man, welcome to the family. And, bro, when he said that, I put my finger up like this, and I had to walk off a bit. I had to gather myself because I about, about bawled right there. I said, man, I appreciate it, dude. He goes, nah, he said, there's going to be plenty more time. Like, just, just welcome to the family, man. Woo. So, yeah, that, that was awesome. a big step, man. About brought me to tears. Awesome, uh, man. That, what a... What a, uh, not only career, what a life for you. What an interesting, uh, you know, from Omega, to ECW, WWF, dealing with the, the rock being, I mean, what a, what a wild ride for Marty Garner. Bro, it's been crazy, man. And I've actually done talk shows. I did Montel Williams talk show. I did Sally Jesse Raphael and I did Jenny Jones. And I used to be, I used to do a rap. I was a rap artist at one time. I had a rap album out, um, just out at the shows, it was a, something I did myself. You know, it wasn't like a nationally uh, uh, produced rap album. But uh, man, I've done all kind of crazy stuff. Man, I've tried so hard all my life to to get to that next level, and I never got there. Which, and it's okay. I'm not bitter, but you know, it's just it's not. It hadn't been the right thing, I guess. Not the right time. Not the right thing. And and that's fine. But, uh, what's uh, but what's next for you? What what do you got coming up? Um, there there's a match coming up. It, it's not real soon. It's like in, I think it's like in a month. It's a tribute to uh, Andre the Giant, and uh, they asked me to be on the show. Uh, and Mark Henry's going to be there. Jerry Lawler's going to be there, as a matter of fact, and uh, a few other guys from here and there scattered in and out. I'm looking really forward to doing that, man. That's going to be a lot of fun, and. Um, uh, right now, I'm, I'm coaching my little girl's softball team, and um, you know, I, I also am a uh, MMA uh, judge for North Carolina and a boxing judge for North Carolina. So I do a lot of that too on the weekend. Uh, I might judge an MMA fight this weekend. Next weekend, it might be a boxing match somewhere, or, or I might be off the next weekend. You know, but uh, I've always got something going on, man. Uh, I, I keep it. Uh, I keep it jumping. Where can everybody find you? I know you said no more Facebook, but where can everybody maybe uh, reach out to you social media wise or just kind of follow along with what you're doing? Yeah, uh, you can go to uh, Twitter. It's uh, Marty underscore Garner, G A R N E R, Marty underscore Garner um, at Twitter. Uh, and then uh, my uh, Instagram is, let's see, it's at, uh, no, Instagram is Champagne22. Yeah champagne 22 and um i also have a youtube channel it's uh champagne c-h-a-m-p-a-i-n marty garner um you can find a lot of my videos on on there and uh but yeah reach out to me on those two platforms and uh or my my email is uh is uh marty garner 2014 at yahoo.com all right marty thank you so much for all the time really appreciate it Yes, sir, man. Thank you for having me, John. It's been a blast, brother.